So I began to think about the faker mental breakdown video that happened after his series against Gen G. Or if you don't know, he was caught from a fan camera, like in the in the audience. Uh, showing him banging his head against the wall. Nothing like crazy violent, but certainly something of like concern or whatever, and his teammates had to pull him off, right? So everyone's been talking about this in the community, uh, but I'd like to go at it from a different angle in the fact that Faker is clearly, obviously, in the 1% of best players, you know, in League of Legends or even in esports history, in fact, if you just collate all the players together, right? He's in the likes of, you know, Flash and Boxer and Simple and things like that. But there's the idea of getting to the 1% is actually incredibly difficult because going from 99 to 100% is harder than going from 0% to 90%, right? If we're talking about like a progression, right, of like, say, you know, level 0 to level 90 versus level 90 to level 99 or whatever, right? Like maybe nobody could get level 100, right? But you could, maybe a couple people can get to level 99 and that's like the faker and the flashes and boxers and stuff. And I know when, like, for instance, as an analogy, like World of Warcraft, getting to level 60 takes a ton of experience, whereas getting to level, say, 1 through 40 takes, like, the same amount of experience as it does to go from level 59 to level 60, right? I think that's, like, some somewhat equivalent. It might might have my numbers a little bit off, but... There's a crazy pursuit for some of these professional athletes to even get an extra 1% or an extra 2%, right, when it comes to their physical game. And I'd like to draw our attention over to something, you know, that's more traditional, which is basketball. So if you don't know the story of Steph Curry, essentially what happened when he was going through high school and whatnot is he was very good. He was in incredibly good, obviously, but he wasn't great, right? At that moment, he wasn't great. And he kept kind of missing his shots and everything. And so his father, who was a former NBA player, said, son, we have to essentially redo your entire shot. So what they did was they said, all right, you aren't allowed to shoot how you normally shot before. I think it was something like he was kind of shooting from his hip. So he would like bring the ball up from his hip and then uh, release it versus, you know, nowadays, if you look at his shot, it's like he goes from up above instead. And so he had to work throughout like his whole summer or something or like two summers to completely reset his shot. And when he did that, he completely sucked. He was terrible at shooting, you know, obviously famously Steph Curry is famous for shooting three pointers, right? Well, he sucked ass at it. But the reason why he did that was because he had to go back to reset himself in order to get up to that, you know, call it 85%. Maybe he was at an 80%, but in order to get that extra 5% to become better, to get to the elite levels, he had to reset his entire fucking game. And I, I think normal people can't really relate to something like that. You know, it's kind of like uh, me, myself, for instance, I'm very good at typing. I can type 130 words per minute, but I don't use the, the home row, right, where you have your, uh, your hands on ASDFG and, you know, whatever the other letters are. Like, but I can still type at 130 words per minute. Uh, but that means I'll never be in the 1% fastest typers because, you know, I use like uh, only these three fingers, right? I don't use all of my fingers and my thumbs, uh, but I don't use my pinkies. And <clears throat> this is akin to someone like, for instance, let's bring it back over to League of Legends with Mata. Mata, it, it's famous, and I don't know if this is legend or not, but it's kind of a cool story anyways, is that Mata, the great old school support for KT Rolster, he had, uh, what he did was he learned all five roles. He got challenger in all five roles in Korean solo queue, which is 
fucking bonkers. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's a cool story. But it just goes to show that what he thought to improve his game was to try and understand every single different role. Even though he's a support main, you know, he decided, okay, I'm going to learn maybe ADC. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's probably natural for support to at least want to kind of learn ADC. But then he learned, you know, mid lane, he learned jungle, he learned top lane. Like when you look at that from an outsider, you just think like, what? Why would you do that? There's only a little bit of amount uh, that you could learn in order to improve your game as a support. So, like, why would you spend all that time doing that? Well, that's to get those extra percentages of being really fucking good at League of Legends. So, <clears throat> the title for this video, unless I change it, is The Gap Between Expert and Takumi. So, if you don't know what Takumi is... In Japanese, it's essentially an expert, but it's like grandmaster level, right? It's a master craftsman. And of course, all of you that are familiar with anime are going to be thinking of Initial D at this moment. Yes, that's actually where uh, Takumi's name, the uh, protagonist for Initial D, comes from. Is His name means, you know, fucking maestro. It means master craftsman because he's very good at driving cars. But the thing about Takumi was he literally breathed and slept racing, right? He was thinking about racing constantly, even when he was doing tofu deliveries and things like that. But Takumi in Japan is actually a real thing. There are positions in Japan to where you could be a Takumi of your particular craft. Now, for instance, let's draw parallels to the car world. At Nissan, at the Nissan factory in Japan, they have what are called Takumi like craftsmen uh, who build the engines in the GTR, right? The Well, it's not the Skyline anymore, but it's the R35 GTR, right? The most badass Nissan that you can get. Well, what they do is they have a Takumi that is assigned to build the engine for that particular GTR that's rolling off of the line. And what he does is he assembles the entire engine, like, basically by himself, and then he signs a plaque at the very front of the engine saying that it was built by him. So he literally puts his name on the engine. And it's kind of cool, but it just shows the craftsmanship that goes into something of like a Japanese product. Now, also, there are like, uh, you know, Jap Japan is known for people that are like put within an industry and they just keep going for years and years. There are like special master craftsmen or takumi for bows or yumi as now. Yeah, you're thinking of the a shitty fucking champion. I actually don't know why they called yumi uh, in League of Legends like Yumi, the name, because Yumi uh, in Japanese means bow. So there's a family <clears throat> that uh, makes longbows in Japan, and his family has been doing it for, I think it's over like 500 years, <laughs> which is fucking insane to think about, that a family lineage can go on since way back in, you know, the samurai days of like Nobunaga and shit and create bows. Well, this guy's been doing it and his father had taught his father and his father had taught his father for as long as time, right? So <clears throat> these people are willing to go to lengths to just get that fucking extra 1%. And I don't think a lot of Westerners can understand that aspect. Now, I hearken back to League of Legends once again with the example of LS. LS, I believe it was at least said in a Summoning Insight episode, the reason, partly the reason why LS had quit Cloud9 was because of the systems, right? So when Jack and everybody talks about the systems of Cloud9, they're typically meaning like the actual regiment that Cloud9 goes through. And if you don't know through various different types of podcasts and different interviews and, and things like that, is that they're meaning like they go to the gym, they have a bedtime, you know, they all live in the same house, uh, which 
it, it's like an old school gaming house from, you know, back in the day. And they still do that versus nowadays, a lot of Western teams will actually have their players get different apartments that they get to stay at. Maybe they stay in the same apartment complex, right? But you know, they, they all have their own separate bedrooms and things and actual different entities of where they actually live. And then maybe they'll go to the office and start practicing there versus cloud nine. It's all encompassing. They're all on one compound. But <clears throat> that's the difference here is that there are certain people that are willing to, you know, do the ancillary things. And then there are certain people that won't like, you know, assumingly the types of like LS believing that a going to the gym or having bedtimes isn't really going to help your game. What the fuck does that have to do with playing League of Legends to a very high degree? And to some extent, I can actually believe that, you know, it's like, yeah, why would necessarily having a bedtime help you become the best League of Legends player possible? And the one thing that I'll defend here is the fact that, yes, it, it may help you after you get very, very, very strong fundamentals down and you actually know the game to a very high degree, then yes, maybe you can roll back and actually do some of those things, right? It's like, uh, you know, min-maxing in Elder Scrolls makes for an interesting experience for playing the game, you know, no doubt if you max on intelligence, but say you don't uh, put any points into dexterity or, you know, health or whatever resistance is. And it's like, yeah, your guy can nuke everybody, but anytime he gets touched, he's fucking dead. So you have to play the entire game, not getting hit at all, but you know, you can do massive amounts of damage. <laughs> like it's, it's a, it's a fun way to play the game, but it certainly makes it more difficult in different types of scenarios. And so <laughs> obviously, you know, if you play the game of League of Legends just like that too, and you try and min-max of just playing solo queue or whatnot, and you don't round out the other areas of your life, then it's gonna make things very difficult for the rest of, you know, whatever else you have to do in your life. And I think a lot of these professional players can get stuck within that mindset of having to just min-max League of Legends itself because for worse or for better, I think a lot of men especially put their value within their work, right? Because it's it's what you can do for the world and not necessarily who you are as a person, right? People, uh, as a man, people often value you for what you can bring, you know, to a particular like job occupation or even a friendship, you know, maybe if you have skills or whatnot. But necessarily you yourself or your personality or like who you are as a person like yeah it's valuable but also it's incredibly valuable for the skills that you bring to you know a certain type of relationship and that's how i think a lot of men perceive themselves especially within the world and that's obviously propagated by ourselves as well and i think this entire idea of being of one mindedness and especially for someone for the likes of faker I'm not saying that i can necessarily understand the shoes that he's in obviously because he's a national icon he's league of legends face the face of league of legends he's the face of esports right like everybody even from dota even from counter strike go or cs2 now people from fucking rocket league like everybody knows who he is obviously. And anyone under, you know, call it 25 years old probably knows who Faker is. But <clears throat> it's this single-mindedness within that Korean culture, which has been embroiled since basically the separation of North and South Korea. So if you don't know, the uh, South Korea, essentially when they broke off, they were very poor in fact they were actually poorer than north korea and they were all into like agriculture and things like that so was the north as well but the way that they got ahead was they started to invest in like technology and business and the way that they did that was they subsidized a certain couple of different companies and they gave them subsidies they gave them cash you know or loans for instance at very low like interest rates and stuff like that and so i'm not going to go into like the boring shit but if you don't know like 
companies like Hyundai or LG or Daewoo, you know, back then, uh, Samsung, and even now like Hanwha or SK Telecom, they're also these groups or these big companies are called chables and they essentially run a South Korea, right? It's something like, I think Samsung has like 30% of South Korea's GDP. Like Samsung owns fucking, uh, they run hospitals, and they have like, they do like military stuff. Like it's, it's wild. <laughs> but the point is, is that they are min maxing. And that's what South Korea has always been. In fact, is min maxing shit. The government said, Hey, we're going to min max these couple different companies. We're not going to give to every single company a subsidy. And we're just going to give these different companies a subsidy. And we're just going to min max the fuck out of Hyundai, or we're going to min max the fuck out of Samsung. And so as long as you can provide one good thing and min max, essentially you are valuable in those types of societies. So I think the Eastern mindset, and this also includes Japan as well, I think the Eastern mindset is fundamentally wrong. Like you may have more to gain from, you know, working on another skill, for instance, even if it's tangentially connected to your main talent. Now, yeah, that's not going to help that particular company like Hyundai or Samsung if you're, you know, more well-rounded necessarily, Uh, but it is going to help the individual and maybe that might spawn off into more entrepreneurial things, which is why I think America is, you know, uh, we're like a country full of entrepreneurs and stuff. And I think you may have more to gain from working on another skill because of this, call it 1% gap. For instance, if your social skills might be at like level 40, but your mechanics in League of Legends are at like a level 92, I think it'd be much easier to level up your social skills, getting to like, you know, level 80 or something like that, than it, and it may actually, actually help your overall game as far as even playing the game League of Legends, you know, going from level 92 to level 94 in mechanics, right? Because now you're able to talk to your teammates and discuss things and actually get your point across a little bit more eloquently than you would have been able to. And instead, you know, you would have just been a little bit slightly better at mechanics. So I think this whole min max type situation can actually snowball into something that isn't necessarily helping you at the end of the day. And Beardson is one of those people that actually realized this. So there's actually a video that I looked up back in the day. It was like in 2017 or 2018. He did like a TSM documentary, I want to say. And he realized and he said that he was like trying to play, you know, two extra hours of solo queue, even though his teammates or something were trying to get him to go out and go out to have dinner or something like that. And he'd say, nah, 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 I'm, I'm just going to chill and I'm going to play solo queue and I'm going to, I'm going to start grinding. I got to, you know, play a couple different games on Syndra, even though he's <laughs> played multiple games on Syndra. And he started to realize that it actually wasn't worth it. Like, in order to round out him as a person and as a player too, he actually had to start spending time with his teammates to start developing the social environment with his teammates and also to develop his other skills, you know, his social skills. And then he started to read books as well too, because, you know, now famously, at least everyone knows that Bjergsen is very into books. And that actually started to help him get out of the mindset of, you know, being always within the universe of League of Legends and having his entire, I guess, identity tied to League of Legends and being able to think outside of the box of League of Legends to then bring into the box of League of Legends. And I don't think a lot of players actually realize that. Now, when you're at the level of Faker, the problem is, is that you're constantly changing who the 1% actually is. Because when you're climbing up, and this is just like within economics, for instance, right? 
If you're making $100,000, suddenly you get a new group of friends and maybe all your friends are making $150,000. Or maybe you know in your employment, obviously if you're making $100,000, you're talking to maybe other board members on the company board and those people are making $200,000. Or maybe you're talking to the CEO and he's making $4 million a year, right? And so the area in which you exist is always changing and you're always not maybe the 1% because of the group that you exist in. And so it's very easy to get lost in the sauce of are you actually the 1% and the best players uh, you know, within the world or are you not? And Faker right now is in that 1%, but that group of people is Chovy. You know, it's BDD, it's Showmaker, it's Knight, right? So all those players exist there. So it may not actually feel like he's in the 1%, right? So I'll end with a story actually that's pretty appropriate for the idea of Takumi, Faker, and that whole idea of being in the 1% and being the best and trying to stay the best. And it's from Faker's actual nickname, which is the Unkillable Demon King. So I don't know if this was intentional or not, um, but in the Korean aspect, I actually don't really know what his name means. But in the Japanese aspect, the Unkillable Demon King actually is from Japan. It was actually the Shogun Nobunaga. And so Nobunaga was very famous in Japan because he ended up being essentially a tyrant shogun. And so what he did was he ended up killing a temple of priests. And so the whole of Japan got really pissed at him. And so a lot of his inner sanctum people started to hate him. And so one day he was caught without his entire army. He had like a small regiment right? And he ended up getting surrounded by his enemies. Uh, often, you know, a lot of them were like traitors and things. And he locked himself within a type of house or whatnot. It might have been a temple or something. And he told his guy to light it on fire, like his second in command. He told it, told him to light it on fire. And then he committed seppuku, and so Nobunaga became the unkillable demon king because no one actually killed Nobunaga. In fact, he committed seppuku and he also burned himself alive with his entire family, I believe. Uh, so he became the unkillable demon king. So in parallel with Faker, I hope he doesn't actually live up to his moniker of the unkillable demon king. I hope he doesn't destroy himself in trying to become the best player of League of Legends, you know, forever and hold on to that power forever because at some point he has to give it up. So although I respect and I love watching Faker play and to be a Takumi of League of Legends, I actually don't think that he realizes he's already in the 1%. He's already the Demon King. He's already the Takumi. And I don't think that extra, call it 1%, that may or may not exist is actually worth it for a player like Faker.